Sophie Toscan de Plantier was brutally murdered in 1996 in a small village of Skull in West Cork, Ireland. The seaside town of Skull, where Sophie spent her final days, is a secluded, isolated beauty spot. Sophie's murder was anything but quiet. Today, behind the crime, we delve into the sinister case that rocked West Cork, and to this day leaves a sinister stain on the community. Each week on Behind the Crime, we examine true crime cases. We take a deep dive into the untold facts that paint a more complete picture of the crime. Thank you for your support. Each like and subscriber means a lot to us, so hit the button and help us continue to work in bringing you Behind the Crime. Let's get into the murder of Sophie Plantier. 25 Facts Explored Number 1 Sophie Tuscan de Plantier. Sophie was born in 1957 and raised in Paris. She married in 1980 and had a son named Pierre Louis the following year. Sophie was a producer of documentaries for French television on subjects about art and various subcultures. In 1991, she remarried to the renowned French film producer Daniel Toscan de Plantier. Sophie's family and friends describe her as being elegant and measured. She was said to be interested in everything. She was highly intelligent and always marvelled at the things that could broaden her knowledge. She was never a woman who sought fame and often avoided the limelight. Sophie had a natural beauty, only ever wearing a little makeup, a touch of lipstick and a little eyeshadow. She was a frequent visitor of Cork and Skull. She fell in love with Ireland after visiting the country when she was a teen. She believed that one day she would return to stay indefinitely. When that time came, she settled against the advice of her friends and family on an extremely remote area of West Cork. Sophie considered her Irish farmhouse a refuge from her busy life in France. But the quiet setting she loved soon turned deadly. At approximately 10 in the morning on December 23rd, 1996, a neighbour spotted Sophie's body lying in a path near a house in Torremore, West Cork. It was clear she had been brutally attacked, beaten and murdered. Murder hadn't occurred locally for decades, meaning the Irish police had no experience with this type of investigation. Sophie's gruesomely murdered body, dressed in a t-shirt and leggings, was left outside in the harsh Irish weather. The state pathologist who was due to investigate the murder scene was celebrating his 63rd birthday and so unfortunately did not travel till the next day. The fact that no one was ever murdered in West Cork likely played into his decision not to travel immediately. As well as that, West Cork is over 200 miles from where he lived and it was Christmas busy time of year to travel. Unfortunately, this meant that Sophie's body was left out in the cold overnight, watched over by two policemen. That was one of the things that angered every one of us. To think that this poor girl was left lying there for so long. It's not what we'd like to see for anyone of our own. Given the 24 hours that elapsed before the pathologist arrived, it was impossible to pinpoint a time of death due to the lack of body temperature data. There's no doubt that if the, the longer our body is around, the more difficult it becomes to assess actual time of death. You can be reasonably accurate if the body is found quickly in an ongoing temperature, but once a day passes, you'll have a variation in the ambient temperature. Other forensic evidence had been lost due to the delay and as the Irish police didn't have experience, the scene quickly became contaminated. Soon, reporters and photographers walked around the house, trudged across the grass, leaving fibres of their clothing and strands of their hair everywhere. And the story of Sophie's murder made it to French television before Irish police had even managed to contact her husband. French television, radio and newspaper reporters were amongst the crowd. The autopsy revealed that Sophie had 50 injuries, her face had been battered with a concrete block and a rock, her fingers were broken, presumably from trying to defend herself. She had apparently run through briars and encountered barbed wire, possibly in a bid to escape. 
No signs of sexual assault were found. The winter night was long, and Irish weather can be violent and unforgiving. Would she have welcomed a visitor in the dead of night? Was she propositioned by the intruder? Did her refusal kindle rage in her murder? Her husband imagined such a possibility. They said it was not a sexual crime, he stated. But that might have been the trigger. Someone might have wanted to seduce her. She refuses, resists, and it all goes wrong. The murder of Sophie de Plantier reads like a crime fiction novel with unimaginable twists at every turn. Let's take a deep dive into the details and go behind the crime. Number two, the investigation. The crime scene presented a number of unusual facts. Two wine glasses were found in Sophie's house following her death. The front door keys were left in the door which remained unlocked. There was a wallet full of cash by Sophie's bed untouched, rooming out a robbery. Blood was found on Sophie's front door. At the site of her murder lay a blood-stained concrete block. In the gate of the scene had multiple blood marks. Back in 1996, for successful DNA evidence, you needed a teaspoon full of blood. Nowadays, two head hairs is enough. Unfortunately, the blood samples taken at the scene and DNA evidence was not enough to identify anyone apart from Sophie. Ian Bailey became a person of interest and suspect to the Irish police early on in their investigation. One reason for this was the scratches on Bailey's arms and hands and another because of the in-depth knowledge he had on Sophie's injuries when he reported in the newspaper. Number three, Ian Bailey. A former British freelance journalist, Ian Bailey, fled the bustling city life in 1991 to settle in secluded West Cork. To his neighbours and Skull, he had never been a man of wholesome reputation. For years, the stories were rife. Everyone knew him as an oddball, a frightening blow-in who beat his girlfriend, Jules Thomas. Bailey worried people, they tried to stay away from him. He engaged with a bohemian lifestyle and led peculiar poetry recitations in public places. To many who lived in the area, Bailey remained a stranger, someone to be weary of, at nights. When Skull was dark and quiet, Bailey could be heard howling at the moon. Slarthy asked, was it true he'd been seen out one night in the rain wearing only his jocks and a hat? She had heard rumours of him howling at the moon at night with what he described as Mr. Bailey's thinking stick. Bailey's neighbour Brian Jackson referred to him as a strange man. Bailey was the first journalist to arrive at the crime scene as he lived close by. Irish police report that he was acting suspiciously and that he didn't ask any questions which would be highly unusual for a journalist. Despite the suspicious whispers throughout the community, Bailey continued to cover the murder for press headlines at times, supplying breaking news and displaying an unexpected and eerie intimacy with the details of the crime. The Irish police said that Bailey's articles contained details about the victim's injuries, which hadn't been made public. Bailey claimed that this information had come to him through a local photographer and other journalists. Despite all of his attempts to dissuade the press, Bailey quickly became a prime suspect, in both the eyes of the Irish police and public opinion. His strange behaviour and knowledge of the death long before anyone else knew about it sparked a fuel of investigations into his whereabouts on the night. Number 4. Turkey Scratching Bailey claimed on the 22nd of December that in the process of killing a turkey, he got a scratch on his hairline. Bailey also claims he received scratches on his arms and hands while chopping down a Christmas tree. Local residents claimed that on Christmas swim, days after Sophie's murder, they noticed scratches on his hands. In June's statement, she said she did not see the scratches on his forehead on the morning after the murder and hadn't seen them before. I'm sure I have no recollection of seeing the scratch on his forehead on the Sunday. Jules alleged that the reason she did not see the scratches was that Bailey's hair may have been brushed a different way. 
In the local bar where Bailey was drinking the night of the murder, nobody saw his scratches. Bailey claimed that this was because he was wearing a long sleeved jacket. When Irish police noticed the scratches, they made a record as part of the case's evidence. Unfortunately, they did not have a photographer present, so took a sketch of the scratches. However, they did not follow up by sending a photographer, which turned out to be a major mistake in compiling the evidence. Number five, Bailey is arrested. On February 10th, 1997, two months after Sophie's murder, Ian Bailey was arrested. Following questioning, Bailey is released without charge. His partner Jules was also arrested and released. The Irish police argued that Bailey needed to be charged as there was every possibility that he would kill again. However, charges were not made by the public prosecutor. When the Irish police arrested Bailey, they told Sophie's husband, we've got him, he's in the car. However, Bailey was still released after 12 hours of questioning. Rarely has police been so sure of their suspicions and at the same time, so incapable of finding the evidence. Sophie's husband said, I criticised them for throwing out his name with such incredible recklessness. It is terrifying. On January 27, 1998, over a year after Sophie's murder, Bailey was arrested for a second time. Again, he was released without charge. Later, it emerged that the reasons the public prosecutor did not make charges was due to the unreliable evidence an unfair bias from the Irish police. Under Irish law, you can be arrested twice for two 12-hour periods of detention. A third arrest and detention is not permitted. Under Irish law, you've got two periods of detention, both 12 hours each. The Guardian don't get a third opportunity to interview a suspect. After the second arrest, the public prosecutor told Irish police that a second arrest of Jules would be unlawful. However, she was arrested again in September 2000 against this advice. In 1998, Sophie's family began to criticize the Irish authorities' handling of the investigation. When we met for the first time the, the Irish police, we have a good exchange with, with them. That's, that's true. At the same time, they didn't succeed. This has angered her family, and in an interview published in the Examiner newspaper today, their lawyer accuses the Department of Justice here of stalling a request for access to the file on the case. They lodged a criminal complaint in France to aid with their investigation. We believe that by filing this complaint, this criminal complaint here in Paris, in France, we help, in a way, uh, the better collaboration between the French justice and the Irish justice. So will the French police be coming to Ireland? It might, might be so, yes. Sophie's family was assured that the investigation would be concluded in a reasonable time. In 2002, a new team of Irish detectives were assigned to the case and began a full review of how the Irish police had led the investigation. Following this review, a new case is submitted to the public prosecutor, but again, no charges are made due to the lack of new evidence. Around the same time in 2002, Sophie's parents lodged a civil action in France against Ian Bailey for a wrongful death. They later dropped this case in a light of French criminal proceedings commencing against Bailey. In 2008, over 10 years after Sophie's death, French detectives and forensic experts arrived in Ireland to examine evidence and take statements. Sophie's body was exhumed for more forensic examining. The Irish police provide the investigating French magistrate with the entire police file. I think and I hope there will be a prosecution in this case. We, we are working for this. Number six, Marie Farrell. The Irish police were contacted by a mystery caller who seemed to have privileged information about the murder. The chief superintendent appeared on television to ask the caller to call back. In a separate call made from a payphone and using the name Fiona, Farrell told police 
that she saw a man staggering along the road beside Kilpada Bridge, close to the murder site in the early hours of December 23rd at 3am. The claim became key to the case against Bailey. In late January, police linked Farrell to the Fiona calls and she went on to identify Bailey as a man from all three sightings. And I saw a man walking along the bridge just along here. Um, he appeared to be in a drunken state and waving his arms around. In the civil case, Bailey took against the newspapers. Farrell was called in as a key witness. She testified that she had seen Bailey at the bridge outside Sophie's house on the night of the murder. She also claimed that Bailey had tried to influence her into changing her statements. Marie Farrell claims she suffered harassment and intimidation from Ian Bailey, including cutthroat gestures. In 2005, Marie Farrell completely changed her story. She withdrew her statements, which claimed she had seen Bailey near Sophie's house at the night of the murder, washing his boots in a stream. Farrell now said she had been pressured by the police into making false statements, and it was all rubbish. It made a statement saying that the man was Ian Bailey. That's right. Was this man Ian Bailey? No. I told them I was withdrawing the statement. Number seven, bloodied clothes. On the 26th of September 1996, locals claimed to have seen a bonfire outside Bailey's house. It struck them as very unusual to be having a bonfire the day after Christmas. I went for a walk on the 26th of December, St. Stephen's Day, and I saw a fire burning behind the studio. Detectives found a bonfire two to three meters wide at the back of Bailey's house. In the remains of the fire, they found buttons from a coat, jeans and boots and bedding. Unfortunately, due to the fire, no hard evidence could be retrieved. Ian claimed that the fire was burned earlier and not following Sophie's murder. An Italian au pair and friends of Jules' daughter, who was living in the house at the time, was only interviewed years after Sophie's murder. In her statement, she refers to a large bucket in the bathroom where a black coat belonged to Ian was soaking. I remember, uh, you know, taking a shower. There was a large bucket in the shower. A dark coat soaked in there. I believe it was Ian's coat. She found it unusual that it had been washing his coat in the middle of winter. I would say that's unusual. You know, you're washing such a large item that is not easy to dry, you know, in the middle of winter. Recently, a local man made claims that Jules previously told him she helped Bailey clean bloodied clothes. He said that she told him this during a meeting in 2001. He was interviewed by the police about these claims in 2021. Jules Thomas denies that she spoke with this man, saying she didn't really know the man and does not recall talking to him. Number 8. The Missing Gate When viewing the Netflix documentary, we are led to believe that the blood-soaked gate at the scene of Sophie's murder somehow went missing. This allegation led to outcry on social media about the Irish police incompetence surrounding this vital piece of evidence. The untold fact tells a different story. The gate was sent to Dublin where the National Forensic Laboratory carried out various forensic tests. The gate was then retained for a period of six years after which it was decided the gate was of no more value to the murder and investigation and it was disposed of. Senior Irish police source said that the perception of the missing gate is being used as a stick with which to beat the force, but the truth is very different. Number nine, comments Bailey made. On the night of the murder, Bailey said that something bad was going to happen at Sophie's house that night, according to partner Jules' statement. As well as this, he made several comments to locals, which we will now take a deep dive into. Malachi Reed. Malachi Reed's mother tells how Bailey allegedly told her then 14-year-old son that he went up there and bashed her brains in with a rock while giving him a lift home. Malachi asked him how his work was going. And that's when he turned around and said, I went up there and bashed her brains in with a rock. She says, he came out with this. And then there was silence. And I think Malachi just wanted to get home as quickly as possible. 
Malachi Reed was 14 years old when he asked Ian Bailey for a lift home from school one evening in February 1997. Mr. Reed asked him how work was going. Malachi Reed claims Ian Bailey replied, it was fine until I went up there with a rock and it bashed her brains in. Irene suggests Malachi didn't immediately see it because he thought he might have been in trouble for getting a lift home with somebody who was drinking. But the following day, he explained what happened, she says. They went out and made statements to the police. An untold fact here is that the policeman found out that Bailey had given him a lift and was in Malachi's school the next day asking questions about Ian and his movements on the night of the murder. It was only after the police visited the school that Malachi came home and told his mother before she took him to make a statement. In the statement, he said he got a shock and a cold shiver when he heard what Ian had said in the car. But the public prosecutor notes inconsistencies between what Balagi said and his mother's version of events. They concluded that it was abundantly clear Malachi was not upset by Ian Bailey, but only became concerned after his conversation with the police and turned a conversation which had not apparently up until that time alarmed him into something sinister. Richie and Rose Shelley. In Netflix documentary, the story is told by Ian's alleged confession to Richie Shelley, saying that they were in a pub together before going to Jules' house for a nightcap. According to the documentary, Bailey started crying and said, I did it, I did it. I went too far to Richie at about 4 a.m. after Jules had gone to bed. It was said to be like that eerie morning thing after drinking when he'd get strange. And after Bailey's alleged admission, they ran screaming from the house. Two other witnesses, Richard and Rosie Shelley, said Ian Bailey came into the kitchen. He was upset. He put his arms around Richard Shelley and said, I did it. I went too far. The public prosecutor later noted that despite numerous attempts by Richie to get Ian to elaborate at the time, he only ever repeated, I did it, and never explicitly said it was about the murder. The documentary omits the fact that the next morning all four people met up in the pub again and Richie Shelley is alleged to have said to Bailey, Up to last night I thought you were innocent, but now I think you were guilty. The public prosecutor called the evidence dangerously unreliable. Diane Martin Diane, a psychic and former Skull resident, appears in Netflix documentary telling the story of his alleged confession to her at a party. She says she confronted him and accused him of murdering that girl and he replied that he didn't mean for anyone to get involved. What's not mentioned is that Diane allegedly started chanting Ian is a murderer as he played music late on into the night. At a party, Diane Martin said to Ian Bailey, well I, Ian I think you did it, you are the murderer. Later at the party, she started chanting in time to the music, Ian is a murderer. Bailey carried on playing music. The prosecutor said that one had to read her statements to get a full flavour of her unreliability. Her second statement portrays the level of hysteria against Bailey in the local community. Her claims were dismissed by the public prosecutor. It was also alleged Bailey confessed to having murdered Sophie to get a story for the newspapers. Bailey later claimed that this was just an unfortunate use of dark humour. Well, um, one, I, they weren't admissions. I was using irony as a tactic, albeit I can see now very unwisely. Ian Bailey had always maintained that he did not know Sophie. Did you ever meet Sophie uh, Tuscan no. Plantier? However, he was introduced and met French woman Sophie Tuscan de Plantier some 18 months before her murder, according to their next door neighbour. Number 10. Bailey's Denial. In his statement, Bailey changed his account of what he did that night. First, he told the Irish police that he had slept in his bed all night. I went to bed. Stayed in bed all night until the next morning. I never left the house that night. Jules will tell you. Later, he changed his statement and claimed that he had got up to write in the middle of the night in the studio, which is over 250 yards away from the house. Sometime after going to bed, I got up, did a bit of writing in the kitchen. I then went down to the studio. I had a story deadline for the Monday morning. I'd part written the story and I'd researched it, but I hadn't finished it. 
at some point during the night, I left the bed, came down to the kitchen table, and I hand wrote the story. So, and then I went back to bed. Jules also changed her statement to allow for this, first claiming that Ian stayed in bed all night, later changing her statement saying that he got out of bed and that she didn't see him until he came in the next morning and gave her coffee. And that he got up from bed and I would estimate that he got up about an hour later. Jules' daughter, in her statement to police, said that both Bailey and Jules left the house for two hours that morning. They both denied this, and Jules is said to have put pressure on her daughter to change her statement. Bailey has consistently denied that he was involved in Sophie's murder. However, the manner in which he makes the denial, using the same phrase each time, would raise some red flags with body language experts. I had nothing to do with it. And I have nothing to do with this killing. I, I mean, I know that I have nothing to do with this. I, I know that it, I have nothing to do with this. I can assure you or your listeners that I have nothing to do with this crime. You know, we, we have the, the, the death of Madame Sophie Tosca and the plant here, which I had nothing to do with. I've said that a thousand times, maybe said a thousand times more. I have nothing to do with this. If I had have had anything to do with it, which I didn't... Number 11. Bailey sues the newspapers. In December 2003, seven years after Sophie's death, Bailey took a civil case suing seven Irish and British newspapers. Bailey claimed the newspapers had defamed him by naming him as the killer of Sophie Tosca and Plantier. Previously, unseen evidence against Bailey only emerged for the first time during this case. Bailey thought that he would successfully take on the media, however it backfired severely and turned into a perceived murder trial where Bailey looked more guilty than ever. The fact surrounding Bailey's violent and domestic abuse of his partner Jules emerged during this trial. Details and photos of severe beatings and vicious attacks Bailey had made on Jules was presented to the court. According to the report, neighbours got used to seeing Jules battered and bruised. Five assaults have been reported, with more allegedly being unreported. Paul Gallagher for the newspapers suggested to him that he'd inflicted at least five assaults on Miss Thomas. Bailey admitted that Jules had been left with clumps of hair missing from her head, her eye purple the size of a grapefruit, and her lip severed from her gum. She needed eight stitches. Bailey still claimed not to be a violent man. Ian Bailey has acknowledged what have been described as three vicious assaults on his partner Jules Thomas between 19... Bailey continued to beat Ms. Thomas. She received a black eye, a swollen cheekbone and chin, and cuts to her lips as well as bruising to her arms and legs. She still fears for her safety. Jules didn't press charges despite Irish police worries that it might happen again to her or someone else. Some of the most violent beatings had taken place in 1996 the same year that Sophie was murdered. Number 12, partner Jules Thomas. The partner of journalist Ian Bailey had said that life with Bailey was not a bed of roses and said that there was no excuse for violence. She said that attacks happened after a lot of whiskey had been consumed by Bailey. Violence, you can't really contest that, can you? Uh, no, but it has to be taken in context. Is there a context for domestic violence? Well, there, there was in my case because I, 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 I was irresponsible with alcohol. I was irresponsible with whiskey. Jules said that she did not think that Bailey knew what he was doing, adding, this is not an excuse. There is no excuse for violence. I'm pretty disgusted with this behavior, really. It was appalling, said Jules. She said that Mr. Bailey was utterly remorseful over the attack and she forgave him over a period of time. I'd have to take full responsibility. But I mean, it does take two, you know, it, it, it takes two to sang, but I'm not trying to absolve my, my actions. It was hard to put into words, really. It was awful, said Jules, while speaking out about one particular attack where Bailey had pulled out clumps of her hair, separated her lip from her gums, and almost made her lose an eye, putting her in the hospital. Bailey was also accused of making advances on Jules' 18-year-old daughter, who said that he made advances on me on Christmas Day in 1995. I was in the car with him when it happened. He, he didn't touch me physically, but he made me understand that he wanted to get off with me. 
Jewel said that she would not have allowed Bailey in the same house as her daughter if she thought he was a threat. Recently, however, one of Jewel's daughters got married and Bailey was not invited to that wedding. Despite all the beatings and negative attention around Sophie's murder, Jewel stuck with Bailey and proclaimed his innocence for 25 years. However, in April 2021, Jewel's finally separated from Bailey. Number 13. Bailey's fascination with women. Bailey is said to have a very strange fascination with women. Recently, he made several Twitter posts showing young women in provocative poses claiming that he had been in contact with them following his newfound fame in recent documentaries and podcasts. Bailey tried to defend posting these images saying, these people have come to me. They know all about me. They've seen pictures of me and wish to contact me. We are chatting. I love beauty. And these are beautiful ladies. It has also emerged that Bailey wrote in his diaries that he was very aggressive towards women and that he could be a monster. You wrote in some detail about being sexually very aggressive. You said that you were a monster or a beast or something um, like that. I, I, do you know? I, I can't remember. I, might, I may have made a reference to my behaviour towards Jules, that I behaved very badly. Um, but that doesn't make me a killer. Despite his sordid past, it hasn't stopped Bailey from continuing his search for love. Calling himself Ian Kenneth Bailey on dating sites, he claims that he's got a master's degree from University College Cork. And according to dating services, Ian is paying for access to the site and has contacted several women asking to meet them. Number 14, wife of pirate ghost. Soon after being separated from Jules, Bailey struck up a relationship with a woman who had been married to a pirate ghost. In 2018, she had married the 300-year-old ghost of Haitian pirate after meeting him at her home in Ireland. She felt his palpable presence and began to develop feelings for him six months into his frequent visits. Together they agreed to wed and had a ceremony on international waters as marrying a deceased person is not legal in Ireland. She divorced the pirate spirit less than a year later, saying that he had possessed her without her consent. She believes Bailey is innocent of the murder, and said she believes he was targeted for being different. She said that she received a lot of hate for her relationship with the ghost pirate, which led her to empathise with Bailey. I spent a long time trying to move away from that and moving on. I guess that's kind of why I can understand where Ian is coming from, because I got a lot of hate over that. People have talked about his behaviour and called him crazy. Bailey and this woman have reportedly been in regular contact, speaking almost every day. Neither will comment on whether the relationship has been intimate. She claims a close connection with Bailey, which she feels has the potential to turn into something more. I would say we're at the point we've made a connection, and that really doesn't happen very often for me. Number 15. Bailey's love of the limelight. Bailey has not hidden from the publicity surrounding his possible role in Sophie's murder. In fact, he turned to the media every chance that he could. Every week, new interviews with Ian Bailey are splashed across Irish media. His poetry speaks volumes of his fascination with notoriety. In one poem entitled The Prisoner, he even compares his trials to those of Jesus, a man who slept peacefully while his disciples had it. When Bridget McLaughlin, a reporter for Ireland's Sunday Independent, travelled to Skull for an interview with Bailey in July 1997, he initially brushed her off, announcing that his lawyer had instructed him not to speak about the crime. Same day, however, he met the reporter. According to McLaughlin, he had become an expert on the case and discussed theories and counter-theories with excitement. Despite his lawyer's cautious words of not talking, she said Bailey just kept on speaking in great detail. He simply can't stop, she said. The casual way he referred to the murdered woman as Sophie, as though he had become intimate with her in the aftermath of the crime. When McLaughlin asked how he had survived 12 hours of questioning, he replied, The police lost their temper, not me. They seemed to completely forget who they were up against, a seasoned journalist. I meditated throughout the whole interrogation. Sophie's husband, Daniel Duplanty, also expressed a surprise at Bailey's behaviour. 
the O.J. Simpson story is having babies. Bailey has chosen to court the media. If I were in his place and I was innocent, I would have run away and changed my name and my life. Did you ever think about leaving Ireland as a consequence? No, I, I didn't. And I've chosen to stand here, stand proud, protest my innocence and fight. And I will fight on. And I'll fight them on the beaches and I'll fight them in the courts. Bailey alleges that Princess Diana had flirted with him when he was a member of the press in the UK. Bailey says that the thing I remember about Diana was she seemed to be, have a habit of flirting using her sapphire blue eyes. I was always, always the tallest member of the press pack and our eyes would meet. She seemed playful and would flutter her peepers at me. She was tall and I was tall and she would pass and you know I, I would sort of nod to her and she would sort of nod and flutter her. But I, it wasn't just me, she was flirting. Number 16. Sinead O'Connor Well-known Irish singer Sinead O'Connor, who currently writes for the Irish newspapers, met Ian Bailey because she wanted to ask him questions surrounding the Sophie Tuscombe de Plantier case in person. In Ian Bailey's mind, O'Connor had contacted him saying, She had become aware of my poetry and she was interested in my poetry with a view to turning one or two of them into songs and that's really what it's all about. However, Sinead O'Connor publicly stated, he is saying I want to put his poems to music. We did talk about his work. I did think this was a way for me to start a conversation with him, but I've got no intention of using his poems for anything. I don't know if he thinks that this was manipulation, but I was determined to ask the questions I wanted to put to him. Sinead said she feels her first question to him was the key one. What do you think should happen to whoever killed Sophie? He got pretty irate at this question. Sinead said. The singer says she pressed on with her questions despite what she says was increasing tension. I asked him, what would you say to the person who killed Sophie if they were here now? The final question was almost a challenge to Bailey, asking him to make a public appeal. I asked him why he had never made a public appeal to the real killers to come forward. I don't believe he has ever done this, she said. Sinead says that this question appeared to most upset Bailey. I came away from Ian Bailey's interview with a huge sense of grief for everyone involved, said Sinead. This is a man who is all about control. Following the interview, an argument broke out on Twitter between Bailey and Sinead. She tweeted, first lesson for Ian Bailey, if he were to go to finishing school, which I'd highly advise, would be the following. In order to appear believable on the big stuff, it is unwise to be daily telling lies about the little stuff. Bailey claimed O'Connor had bombarded him with abusive text messages and labelled him a Slavian of devil-worshipping maggot and a woman heater. He said he was going to publish his own essay about the meeting entitled How I Met the She-Devil. Sinead tweeted that pathological liar and Bailey terrified her. Following the Twitter spat with Bailey, Sinead decided to deactivate her Twitter account. Sinead then said she had arranged with Irish police to hand over unseen footage of her Bailey interview. Number 17. Bailey sues Ireland. In 2014, Bailey attempts to sue the Irish state, saying the Irish police conspired to manufacture evidence against him by unlawful means. Ian Bailey and his partner Jules Thomas arriving at court this morning with Mr Bailey's solicitor for the start of his action against the state. Ian Bailey is suing the state amid claims that he was wrongly targeted as a suspect in the murder. The court ruled that the jury would not see the document where the public prosecutor was highly critical of the Irish police investigation. Marie Farrell was key witness for Bailey during the High Court action. She claimed that the police told her Bailey was a very strange person. And when there was a full moon, Bailey would sit on the beach naked in a rocking chair while ten women would dance round him reciting poetry. The judge quickly asked, where is this beach? And the courtroom exploded in laughter. Marie Farrell continued to make out that she had made up all a story about seeing Bailey near Sophie's house on the night of the murder. While under pressure, Marie got up, took her handbag and walked out of the court in horror of Bailey and his legal team. The state lawyers claimed Marie Farrell's statements had varied so much she could not be relied upon. Lawyers for the Garthi in the state said Marie Farrell's story had varied so often over the years that she couldn't be believed. Bailey ultimately lost the case 
and was presented with a sizable legal blow. Ian Bailey left the High Court this afternoon, having lost a marathon legal battle to face a multi-million euro bill for costs. I can't say anything at the moment, I'm sorry. Number 80. Conviction in France. When a French citizen is murdered in another country, France has the right to carry out an inquiry and prosecute. In Ireland, to get a conviction, you need to prove beyond reasonable doubt. In France, you need a bouquet of indications. In May 2019, 22 years after Sophie's death, Bailey was tried in French court. The French indictment says of Marie Farrell that, quote, the spontaneity of her retractions are doubtful. No, not at all. And that's a, uh, that's a, 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 a great falsity. No, absolutely not at all. In French law, statements made, even if withdrawn, can be used in evidence. The French also alleged that the scratches that were witnessed by locals could not have been carried out by a turkey or the cuttings of a tree. French psychiatrists called Bailey's character into question based on his diary entries claiming Bailey displayed examples of narcissism, psycho-rigidity, violence, impulsiveness, egocentricity, intolerance of frustration, and a great need of recognition. Ian Bailey was convicted of willful homicide and serious assault and battery of Sophie Doscon de Planty. Bailey was sentenced to 25 years in prison in France. Father George left the court a short time after Ian Bailey was convicted in absentia and sentenced to 25 years in prison for his daughter's murder. The judgment is very clear. With all the element of proof, Ian Bailey is a murderer and he killed my mother 22 years ago. So it's a victory for the justice, it's a victory for the truth, and now Ireland will have to extradite Jan Bailey. Number 19. Bailey fights extradition. Bailey's team fought the extradition for the indictment to appear at trial. Mr. Bailey is challenging a High Court decision to extradite him to France. His lawyers argued that documents provided to them in unusual circumstances late last year should be admitted as evidence. In 2011, the public prosecutor gave a dossier to Bailey's lawyer detailing why they hadn't prosecuted. Giving Bailey's legal team this information was unprecedented in Irish law. This dossier provided critical analysis to Irish police investigation which was seen as prejudiced and flawed. Marie Farrell's statements were seen to be completely unreliable. The prosecutor concluded that the evidence can nowhere near warrant a murder charge on Bailey. That document in 2001 demolished the police case against Ian Bailey. At that time, Marie Farrell was still a key witness on behalf of the police. But interestingly, the director's dossier or critical analysis document recognised her total unreliability. Bailey suggested that French prosecutors should travel to Ireland to trial the case under Irish law. And I'm going to suggest that the DPP or the authorities in Ireland invite French prosecutors to travel here to Ireland and to oversee under Irish law my trial here. You would be happy to surrender yourself to the Irish authorities to stand trial in this country. For I this would purpose. welcome it. I mean, it seems like a very strange thing to, for an individual to be saying, I would welcome it. Try me for murder. Absolutely. Bailey fought French extradition measures and in October 2020. The High Court ruled that they do not recognize the law used to convict Bailey and that he would not be extradited to France to serve his sentence. Number 20, Asaf. Due to lack of progress in the investigation, Sophie's family and friends established an organization to reignite the investigation and seek justice for Sophie. Association for the Truth about the murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier, known as Asaf, was set up so that the truth be known and that justice can be done for Sophie. 
They wrote letters to the French president and Irish leaders and over the years have campaigned heavily for the rights of Sophie and that the crime investigation be resumed. The actions of the group spurred on Bailey's trial in France and have led to French presidential requests for Bailey to engage with the French legal system. During a visit to Ireland in 2021, French President Emmanuel Macron spoke about Bailey's conviction and offered Bailey an opportunity to have a new trial in France, which Bailey has refused. Number 21. The Hitman Theory Bailey put out claims that husband Daniel hired a hitman to avoid losing half of his estate in a potential divorce. Bailey insisted that Daniel had other motives as well as he stood to gain from a large life insurance policy. The victim had a large amount of insurance money on her life and the beneficiary of the insurance money was the husband, Daniel Toscano Plantier. Sophie was his third trophy wife. Bailey also pointed to the fact that Daniel did not come to Ireland to identify the body and speak to investigators. And he wouldn't come over to identify the body. However, friends of Sophie told of how devastated Daniel was at the news and the efforts he made to push the investigation forward. It was also pointed out how ridiculous the hitman theory was, given that they would have to use a weapon of opportunity to carry out such an attack. Daniel was eliminated from the list of suspects early on in the investigation. Number 22. The Horse Theory The bizarre theory that Sophie was killed by a horse was quickly dismissed. There is a short video of a local horse expert talking about why he believes this could have happened. I must point out that there is no evidence that this was the case. She, she made her way here, she came down the house, down through the one in through this place here and she commenced to feed the horses up here about central ways up the hillside and it was at this point that she suffered bites to her hands and to her fingers however that being a painful event uh, she would have made an effort to, to protect herself and the horses then with fright continued to um, attack her a bit more and gave some chase. She would have made her way out through the opening here, as far as here with the horses in pursuit. And it was at this point she suffered the fatal injuries. Number 23, Justice for Ian Campaign. Bailey's close friend and ex-wife of the Ghost Pirate has set up a campaign seeking justice for Bailey. The campaign attempted to gather signatures on change.org. The pirate ghost wife sent a letter to Sophie's son Pierre-Louis and other family members asking him to support the petition so true justice can prevail. In the letter she said that I sense that you are still angry and rightly so. Your mother's life was taken too short but the reason I am writing to you is because I believe your anger is misdirected towards Ian Bailey. She goes on to say I know that Ian Bailey is not perfect but I've gotten to know him somewhat through this campaign and, and he isn't the monster you think he is. He is a victim of this crime and, and it has torn his life apart for 25 years. I ask you to please find it in your heart to support and sign the petition for your mum. This letter is the first contact on behalf of Bailey with Sophie's family in the 25 years since her murder. Number 24. Strange Things There are many other strange details surrounding the case that don't have to do with Bailey. Here are some of the most bizarre and unsettling details of Sophie Descartes de Pontier's case, some of which might make you a believer in psychics, ghosts, and even eerie predictions. Before she left for what would be her final trip to Ireland, Sophie had asked multiple friends to go with her, which was most unusual. It's a mystery because she usually liked to go alone, and this time she asked practically everybody to go with her, said a close friend of Sophie. I feel terrible. Because if I had been there, she wouldn't be dead. The day before the Scande Plantier's death, she had visited the ruins of Dunloch at Tree Castle's head. Afterwards, she visited a friend's house and told him about what she'd seen. She saw something terrible and it scared her, Sophie's friend said. She arrived in the house, really scared, saying, Oh my God, I saw a woman, like, like a white sheep. What Sophie reported seeing sounds a lot like the Lady of the Lake the ghost who said to haunt the castle grounds. 
According to the Tree Castle Head legend, each member of the O'Donoghue family is said to have died tragic deaths, causing, as legend tells, a single drop of their blood to fall from the tower into the lake. The legend also says that if someone sees the White Lady of the Lake, she foreshadows imminent death. Sophie died hours later. The forensic reported that Sophie was dressed in white night attire when her body was discovered. It was a chilling detail considering she was dressed like the ghostly spectre she'd seen the day before her murder. Sophie's friend recalled a psychic's prediction before Sophie's death. Before Sophie died, a clairvoyant friend came to my house. There was a photo of Sophie on the wall and she said, Oh la la, this lady, this young lady will have a violent death when she is 40. I replied, that's not possible. Sophie is too vibrant to die. When she was a child, she'd lived with an Irish family for a time. So she had this idea that she wanted to live and buy a house in Ireland. So she traveled down with her cousin, which says she hesitated between two houses. One was in a peaceful Irish landscape of green rolling hills, that sort of thing. And the other was, she called it violence. This became Sophie's home and skull where she was murdered. Sophie's aunt also recalls her daughter, Sophie's cousin, warning Sophie against buying in such an isolated location. My daughter didn't have a good feeling when they arrived, very remote, saying, you're not buying this thing, are you? Don't buy here. Number 25, Sophie's possible pregnancy. Sophie may have been in the early stages of pregnancy at the time of her brutal death. The announcement of this pregnancy to her husband Daniel in Paris may have been made from her West Cork retreat on the weekend she was killed. The revelation Sophie was expecting was supposedly conveyed to her husband by a French-based journalist. However, filmmaker Mr. Toscan de Plantier died without establishing proof of Sophie's condition. An autopsy carried out after Sophie's murder in 1996 was not divulged to her family, despite repeated requests by her late husband. Sophie and Daniel, who had children from previous marriages, expressed a desire for a child. A Paris-based journalist has claimed Daniel Toscan de Plantier revealed to him that Sophie was pregnant. She was in the early stages of pregnancy, and they had talked about it in their last ever phone call, he said. Asking not to be identified, he said the disclosure came on a film set in Le Mans in late 1997. I remember it well. It was a buffet lunch on the set and Daniel approached. He knew I had written on the French reaction to the murder down the years we had met regularly. He gave me a very definite impression. He knew Sophie had been pregnant. He talked continuously about her for about three quarters of an hour and I hardly got a word in. I'm also sure I wasn't the only person he talked to about the likelihood of Sophie expecting a baby. At the time, he was very annoyed about the progress of the police investigation. He also told me he was quite sure who the killer was. Ian Bailey. Is he an innocent man who has been persecuted by the media for over 25 years? Or is he the murderer who is now walking free? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. You know, there is a French expression it says, even if the train is late, the train will arrive at the, at the station. I'm 35. I will wait for the, for the justice to be done. And justice will be done one day. For sure.